I'd like to explain a little bit about why the reform movement has never been accepted and never will be accepted in Judaism. Throughout our history, our long history, there have always been various cults. And cults came about for political reasons, because of ex external influences, and also because of various pressures that Am Israel has had to experience. There's no need really to speak about the Samaritans, the Shomronim, because they're not even considered part of the Jewish people. Even though they embraced part of our religion and faith, they never really intended to embrace the whole thing and become full-fledged Jews. So we're not even going to be speaking about them. The various groups that come to mind in speaking about groups or cults, one of them is the Tzdukim, as known in English, the Sadducees, that lived in the Second Temple era. Jews, like everybody, just like everybody else who participated in the service of the Bet HaMikdash, who believed, of course, in Hashem, who believed in the Torah, but did not agree that the Chachamim had the authority to interpret the Torah as they see it fit. And we know that the Chachamim received authority from the Torah to transmit to us the oral law, the Torah Shebaal Peh, to elaborate on it, to clarify it, as they see, based on circumstances, based on new situations that arise. They have that samchut. They have the jurisdiction to do so. But, as I said, because of political reasons and other agendas, the Tzdukim did not agree, did not follow suit, and that caused a little bit of a split in the nation where you had Tzdukim and Prushim. Prushim were the more observant, religious, those who stuck to the tradition, as was always known. Years later, about 900 years later or so, you had also the Karaim, or the Karaites, who also, very similarly, did not accept that there is a Torah Shebaal Peh, that there is an oral law. Similar to the Tzdukim, they did not give that too much credit. They interpreted the Torah literally. For example, it says that on Shabbat you should not have any fire lit. Well, that means that you sit in darkness. Where the interpretation of that commandment was, you cannot light it on Shabbat. But if you lit it before Shabbat, it's perfectly fine and acceptable. On the contrary, you want to have a beautiful Shabbat. You want to have a lit Shabbat. They're almost gone. There's still a few of them around in today, all over the world, Karaites. We don't marry them unless they completely convert, because they've been completely separated from the Jewish people. So there have been all sorts of groups for a variety of reasons, who drifted from traditional Judaism. The concern, however, and that's a nice topic, is about the reform. Why? Because even though some people drifted, they've completely distanced themselves in such a way that perhaps we can compare it to a soldier deserting the army. And that's a crime, to desert the army, to not go along with it. And that's what they've done. They basically deserted the camp by abandoning everything. So because this is so different, so extreme, we need to understand how it came about. And for that, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the background of how this movement came about. And, of course, the bigger question of all, how come they have been condemned or ostracized by observant Jews? Aren't they just like anybody else? No. As we will see later on, 
they've removed themselves. And as a result of removing themselves, they've brought upon themselves this condemnation. I will also talk briefly about the, another group, another movement called, called the conservative movement that has cer certain similarities in this country to reform. Let's begin with a little bit of background on Judaism. Judaism has been around for over 3,300 years. And Judaism has never only been a faith, an emunah, or just a belief. It's been a way of life. And in this way of life, when a Jew conducts himself according to certain standards that are in the Torah, he would demonstrate or he would act as a witness to the fact that there is a creator, that life is purposeful, yishtachlit, and that there is also a continuous connection between that creator and his creation. And us, obviously there are, much, there are many more ideas that a Jew expresses and lives by, but this is briefly what a Jew testifies to on a regular, on a daily basis. This particular religion, as some would call it, but it's really more a way of life, is very different than everything else around that has ever existed. Because our faith, our emunah, relies on testimony that our forefathers witnessed, they were present there, and they transmitted to us accurately what they saw and what they experienced. As opposed to what? As opposed to all other cults and religions that derive their beliefs from usually one individual or from a small committee of people. Judaism is not only based on testimony of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, but it's also a belief that can be proven it can be demonstrated to be true as well. No other religion can compete with that. No other religion can demonstrate its veracity, that it's real. It relies on one individual, it relies on some tradition. Ours relies on testimony. And remember, we're a stubborn people. And for a stubborn people to accept the yoke of so many commandments that are pretty limiting that are pretty strict, it must be that they have seen something. And this emunah can be demonstrated, it can be proven. And in order to prove it, of course, you have to attend the seminar where many topics will be covered that demonstrate the veracity of the Torah, of our emunah. Now, in this Torah, what's interesting about our Torah is that the Torah documents failures. Failures of various individuals. Failures of an entire people, the Jewish people. Incidents where we failed. Incidents where individuals failed and incidents where the entire nation failed. And the Torah makes it a point to remind us several times that if you follow the Torah, you will succeed you will accomplish your mission, and if you do not follow the Torah, you will fail. And what the consequences are to that failure are in the Torah. We don't need to review that. Unfortunately, Am Yisrael throughout their history has seen too much of those consequences of, of failure. But what is the reason for the Torah documenting those unfortunate incidents, whether they were for, from individuals that did something wrong, or as a group, as a nation. What's the purpose of documenting them? To prove a very important point, that it is possible for a human being to fail. It's very possible. And you've got to be very careful, because this failure will unfortunately repeat itself it will happen again in the future. The Torah is already telling us in advance that the Jewish nation will fail. 
that there will be individuals who will commit transgressions, that this is something, unfortunately, that will happen, will take place. And because of that, the Torah takes preventative measures to hopefully warn us in advance how not to fall into this trap. How there will be some individuals who will attempt to falsify this divine document that we have, the Torah. There will be false prophets who will masquerade and who will attempt to convince us or pressure us to alter that which is written in the Torah or to embrace some other religion and to believe in other beliefs that are against the Torah. The Torah tells us in advance there will be such individuals, Nevi'e Sheker, false prophets, Mesitim Medihim, all kinds of individuals who for whatever reason that they may have, they will attempt to distance us from this precious heritage that we have. Therefore, the Torah has various commandments in place to prevent it. One of them being, this Torah, this document cannot be changed. You cannot add to it. You cannot detract from it. This is meant to be forever. Not only that, one of the principles of our faith, Ikareh Haimunah, has always been that this Torah will never change, no matter what happens. It will never change. It is a Torah intended to be for all times. And that is why our forefathers, throughout our history, at least many of them, were even willing to give up their life and not bow to the cross, not do anything that was contrary to the belief. You know what it means to give your life? For, obviously, they believed. They believed strongly all the years, throughout the generations. Not everyone was willing to give their life. Not everyone had the courage or the conviction, but many did. Obviously, this was very important to them. And that is why the halakha is that if one letter is missing in the Sefer Torah, you can't use it, you can't read from it. It's pasul. Because the Torah was very, very careful in its transmission. And in order for the transmission to be accurate, you cannot tolerate any change whatsoever. There's no compromising. There's no leniency. One letter is missing, one letter is missing, and the whole Torah is pasul. You want to read from the Torah, you've got to take out another Sefer Torah. You can't read from that one that is missing just one letter. However, many times the temptation was very strong, or the pressure was great, and not everybody was able to withstand the pressure. The Torah therefore addresses those pressures too, and it tells us, listen, no matter what happens, you got to be very careful. Lo tilmad lasot goyim. Do not in any way get too close to the Gentiles and learn from their ways. Even if it means isolation, even if it means you're going to be in a ghetto, even though it means you're going to not have equal rights, even if it means you'll be expelled, be careful not to assimilate to them. We're not even talking about intermarriage right now. That's another topic. Just even assimilation, to learn from their ways. Don't get too close to them. So the Torah does encourage isolation. In other words, the Jewish people have to be prepared to be by themselves, if necessary, not to be amongst the goyim. And even when, when, they, when we are in the diaspora, do not mingle too much with them. You are supposed to be a part for your own good. Because if you will not be a part, it will be very easy and tempting to assimilate to them. So we see quite a few times, quite a few warnings of how important it is for a Jew to stay away, to be very careful. There will be all sorts of pressures and temptations to move away from this Torah. And what happens if, if, the, if the time changes? then you will adapt the times to the Torah, not the other way around, not the Torah to the time. The Torah is not changeable. In other words, we have to adapt ourselves to the Torah, not the other way around. Unfortunately, even though everything is so clear, 
and quite a bit emphasized. And we had time after time prophets rebuking us and reminding us. Nevertheless, you always had individuals here and there who were not so religious, not so observant, not so strong to adhere to the tradition, to just do everything right. Not all the time. It was not easy. You had people who liked to have the cake and eat it too. As it's called in Hebrew, They try to have both. They had an idol that they worshipped during the time that they were idols. And they put on tefillin in the morning. They try to do both. Some who were not so careful with certain mitzvot. You always had these kind of individuals. I'd like to compare it to a dropout. You know what a dropout is? There are some kids that drop out of school. They can't take the discipline. They take, can't take the learning. They don't like the structure. And they leave. Even though we all agree that school is important, you got to prepare yourself for life. You got to be schooled. You got to be trained. You got you to become knowledgeable in the basics. But don't we all see, always see dropouts? In every country, in, in every time of our history, there are people who will drop out of school. Now, school is not religion. It's school. There are dropouts from religion too. In the same way there are dropouts from school, there are some people who simply drop out of religion. They can't handle it. They don't want to handle it for whatever reason. Okay. I can understand the dropout. You know what a dropout is like? Somebody dodging the draft. For those of you who don't understand what the word dodging means, it's to try to get away and not be drafted into the army. During the Vietnam War, you, Dave, you probably remember it better than myself, there were people, I think, that went to Canada. For what reason? Just to dodge the draft. Americans were being drafted into the army. Some Americans did not believe in fighting this war. Some people were afraid of war. Some people uh, wanted to, to make some money. People dodged the draft for different reasons. But I can understand somebody wanting to dodge the draft. What I don't easily understand is one who sells the secrets to the enemy. You don't want to be in the army? I can understand. You can, I, can, I can see why. There are various reasons why. But I will not understand and accept if you go ahead and give secrets to the other side, to the enemy. That's treason. And everybody knows treason is one of the worst crimes punishable by, by the death, the, right? Death penalty in most countries. A traitor? And Bezat Hashem in a couple weeks from now, we'll talk about an individual who is a traitor for doing something. I won't tell you what that is right now because that's a separate topic. But in the meantime, this movement called reform, by moving away completely, they're not just dodging the draft. They're actually committing an act of treason against Judaism. They're betraying the whole thing. And you will see why in a moment. It would be possible, if we had the time, to analyze the psychological uh, reasoning behind why people stop observing certain mitzvot. People stop doing many things because they're unhappy. Or as we said with the army, they're just afraid of going to war. It's not important right now that we try to analyze the psychology of people and what really motivated them. What was their reasons for doing what they did? I spoke a little bit about it when I spoke about evolution and how people would prefer to believe in a big bang and in an evolution that they came from a monkey because in this way they can do almost anything their heart desires. There's no God in their eyes, right? Therefore it's easy to do anything you want. But once you believe that there's a God, that there's a creator in the world, it's obviously uh, requires that you conduct yourself in, 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 a, in a certain way. You can't just do anything you want. In the same way, people are motivated very easily. 
who are tempted to move away from observance of religion or belief in a God because of their ta'avot, because of their desires, or because of other psychological uh, problems, issues that each individual may have. And of course we have the pressures. So we don't need to go to, into everyone's reasons for why they may have stopped keeping the mitzvot. I did explain in the past that this doesn't happen overnight. If somebody was observant at one time, to move away from it, it usually is gradual, it takes time. But it does happen for a variety of reasons. What I want to try to explain today is not just why a Jew became secular, dropped out. Why would he want to come up with a completely brand new religion that completely distorts everything that his parents, grandparents, forefathers believed in and gave their lives for? Why would he want to do that? What's the reason for that? That's what concerns me. This is very different than anything else. How did this all begin with reform? It began in Germany. For about 600 years, the Jews in Europe, not just in Germany, were not treated very nicely. They were not liked. They were oppressed. They did not have equal rights. In many places, they couldn't vote. In many places, they had to wear a certain badge or color or hat that they're Jewish, something that identifies them as Jews. I mean, they really didn't have an easy time in many countries in Europe. And in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we're beginning to see a drive in Germany and in a few other countries, France and Great Britain, I think Netherlands too, more or less around the same time, a drive for emancipation. Emancipation means to liberate yourself from the shackles, from the, that which was uh, limiting certain citizens from being integrated completely into the, the society of the country that they were living. And for the Jews, this was very important. That they, and they very, very much wanted, of course, everybody wanted to be integrated to some extent, to be treated fairly. There were some Jews, unfortunately, that took it too far. They were the Tnuat HaHaskala, the Enlightenment, where they believed in bringing down barriers, barriers between Judaism and the non-Jewish world, not to stand out too much, start addressing like, uh, like the non-Jews, remove some of the obvious barriers. But this emancipation, what this did also, It allowed, it gave the opportunity for many Jews to remove themselves completely from Judaism. It was not enough for them just to remove some barriers, but they wanted to be completely like Germans. And that is where the problems began. And I'm not going to, I would like to, I prefer not to mention names on who the founders of this movement was. We are very careful of mentioning names of those who are considered wicked amongst our people, those who cause a lot of harm and trouble to the Jewish nation. So that is why I would prefer not to mention names. If you really have an interest in finding out the years, the places, the names, I mean, it's all documented. You can look it up. What happened in the very beginning of this movement is one of its founders basically got up in one of the meetings and declared openly, we don't believe that the Torah is min HaShemayim. We believe that we have to adapt to the times and therefore we need to also uproot or eliminate all of these commandments that are primitive or barbaric, as one called the Brit Milah, the circumcision, he called it barbaric. And instead, all we should do is adopt the spirit of the words. In other words, some of the nice things, the easy things in Judaism. This is how it started. When they came to America, they even became more extreme. 
they absorbed a lot of the influence of the Protestants. And if you were to go into, you're not allowed to, but if you, if you were able to go into a Reformed temple, you would think you're in a church. When they came to America, they eventually became more extreme, more liberal, moved away even more from Judaism, and allowed intermarriage. And some mixed marriages, you have underneath that chuppah, a priest and a rabbi, a so-called rabbi. Yeah. That's not it. They even became more extreme in the 60s and 70s. Whoever remembers that period of time were the hippies, feminism. People were in a rebellious mood. So was reform. Same-sex marriages now. Reform. Yeah, same-sex marriages. All of this, of course, what did it lead to? A tremendous amount of intermarriage and assimilation. As this is evolving, you have a movement called the conservative. They said, oh, this is too much. This is too much. You know, we have to conserve, conservative, we have to conserve a little bit of the tradition. So even though they still have the philosophies that the Torah is flexible, that you can change it based on the needs and the time, that's what they believe. Nevertheless, they kept a little bit more of the tradition. With conservatives, you have some who are more conservative and some who are more liberal. There's no standards. Nevertheless, the reform went to the extreme, and many of them eliminated the Brit Milah, got rid of the Shabbat, got rid of many, many mitzvot, no kosher. In one of their big meetings that they had, I think it was in Pittsburgh, one of the main guys there served after the meeting, I think, was done, shrimp and other non-kosher food, I think frog legs also, dafka, all this non-kosher food. It came, when they came to the Sidur, they were bothered about any mention of Zion. The Jews will go back to Zion. That's their homeland. No, Berlin is Jerusalem. America is the new Israel. So they, they changed many quotes in the Sidur to accommodate their beliefs, their practices. In many Reformed temples, there's no more Hebrew being used at all. It's all English. After Israel was founded in 1948, there's been a little bit of a return to using Hebrew and to using Tzion and all these things. But basically... They have, been, they have become very, very distant from Judaism as a whole. What is happening today is as a result of uh, their beliefs and their practices, they are wholesale, there are wholesale conversions amongst uh, the Reform for a variety of reasons. One is because, of course, they believed Anybody wants to convert, they can convert. No questions asked. Plus, they can make some money. Plus, their members, the numbers of their members have been dwindling lately because there's no more left. They've, they've, they've gone to become Gentiles. So how do you fill the temple again? You convert some more. So you're seeing a tremendous wholesale conversion <laughs> of those who are willing to convert. And that is why this movement has always been seen as the first step to, to becoming a Christian. For the first step for a Jew to become a Christian. What many, many Christians try to do with the sword, by pressure, here they're doing it voluntarily. They're doing it for free. Without any questions asked. They, they don't care. And that's why this whole assimilation that they are causing is being called a silent holocaust. Because that's what it's doing to many, many Jews who are unaware, of course, because, and it's not their fault, but because they are following these leaders who are a little bit more knowledgeable than their members, that's eventually where this is leading to. I mean, we can talk about this subject at great length as to what happens in some of the homes 
But maybe I'll leave that to the topic of intermarriage itself, where some homes actually have a Hanukkah and a Christmas tree in the same room. But we'll talk about that when we talk about the problems of intermarriage. One of the last studies done about this movement is that they are disappearing. What do you expect? They don't have many kids. They allow intermarriage. And even though they're allowing now, or they're considering that if the father is Jewish, even though the mother is not, the child is still a Jew, according to us, according to Allah, that is not the case. Still, before you know it, they will all disappear. They claim that they are the majority. It's totally not true. The majority of Jews in this country, if anything, are not affiliated. So if anybody ever tries to tell you that they're the majority, it's totally not true. You can count the number of synagogues they have, the number of members in every synagogue, and compare that with the population. And today in America, you have about 5.2 to 5.3 million Jews, give or take. And most of them are not affiliated. Not affiliated means that they don't consider themselves belonging to any particular group. Whereas by Orthodox, Baruch Hashem, they have more children, they've been strong, they've remained orthodox and observant. The numbers have grown, Baruch Hashem. Now we've come to the question, the bigger question. Okay, we understand what has happened, how it happened. It's a very, very unfortunate uh, event, of, of, of course. We, we're not happy about it. But why do we condemn them? Why do we ostracize them? There is a very special blessing in the Amidah. The Amidah used to be called Shmonesre because it's 18 blessings. Now if you count them, we have 19. A blessing was, le- was, was added later. And the blessing is Lamanim v'lamalshenim al tikva. Let there be no hope to the informers. Informers, you know what an informer is? One that tells the authorities about what you're doing, especially the non-Jewish authorities. In other words, he endangers other Jews. And there was a need to do that, a need to include that blessing. Rabban Gamliel included that blessing. And don't get the wrong idea. That blessing was not added for us to pray for their demise. Let them disappear. Let there be no hope for them. No, chas shalom. We don't pray for the demise of any other Jew. The main idea behind this blessing was, if we say it, on a regular basis, three times a day, hopefully we will be wary of them because they're dangerous. The Chachamim did not want us to become too close to them, so we should not learn from their ways, so we should not assimilate and become just like them. So therefore they added this blessing so we should stay away from them. Totally not associated, totally have nothing to do with them whatsoever. So very similar in this case, there's always the danger of getting too close for comfort and learning from their ways and becoming like them. Some of the great rabbis of the generation where this group was emerging said something scary. They said like this, it is better that they disappear into oblivion, but the Torah shechaz v'shalom never change. If there is has shalom a chance that somebody may touch, may change the Torah, it is better for an entire group of people to disappear, to vanish. That is better. Let them vanish if that's what's necessary to save our Torah from being tampered in. They claim that they are Jewish. Maybe biologically. If the mother is Jewish, then you are Jewish. But they should not really call themselves Reform Jews because they're not really representing Judaism. In in the same way that you have a patent on a product, what's a patent? The original thing. But the Chinese know how to forge many patents, right? Right? And forging that patent is a crime. It is wrong. It's fake. So therefore, by them using the name Judaism, they're trying to forge a patent. It's fake. It's completely fake. That's not Judaism. And they no longer have the right 
to speak for Judaism because of their total disrespect. They have a total disrespect when you confront them. They have a total disrespect for original Judaism, for the Torah, for the Talmud, for everything that we know to be holy to us, they're totally disrespectful. One of them was so amazed when he saw a book, a siddur, I think it was, falling to the floor, and an Orthodox Jew picking it up and kissing it. It moved him so much that eventually I think he became religious too. This is how we look at our books, at our tradition. A book falls down to the ground, picked it up and he kissed it. These guys have been so disrespectful, therefore they don't have any more the right to claim that what they have is Jewish in any way. It's not. It's fake. And the world knows what true Judaism is anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Right. It's our obligation to go out to the world and try to bring back peace to some which too has been. Very good question, and I'm going to speak about that soon. The question is, again, isn't there a mitzvah to be mekarev, to bring back Jews who are lost and uh, hopefully bring them back into the fold? Then why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it the, with the reform movement? Even though I, I have at times, of course, attempted to convince individuals of all backgrounds that that is what they should do. There is no initiative, per se, to go after that particular group, and I'll explain soon why. In order to understand how this could happen, I mean, I, I explained to you that it happened, that it happened as a result of the emancipation. But I did not explain to you fully how they completely did away with everything. Because that, that's what's really puzzling. Because we said in the very beginning there were always Jews who were not comfortable or who couldn't take it. And, but at least they believed the Torah is divine. The Torah is miyashamayim. Okay? But you don't have to go too far. Christianity began like that. Like a cheap copy of Judaism. And who started it? Paul. Not Jesus. Not Yeshu. And what did he do? He first got rid of the mitzvot. No brit milah. Right? No kashrut. No tefillin. That's how he started. Later on, he changed the day from Shabbat, Saturday to Sunday. Then some changes to the holidays. And where was the emphasis in Christianity? Only belief. Only munah. If you believe, you're saved. He made it easy for all these pagans in the world to become uh, somewhat religious. All you need is a belief. So the system of Christianity, and the reason why it succeeded, even though they did it by force too, right, is because it's not hard. It's easy. The main idea behind Christianity is the belief, the belief in certain things. This is where Judaism is so different. Judaism believes in actions, in mitzvot. As the Sefer HaChinuch says, HaLevavot nimshachot achara perulot. One's heart is affected by one's actions. Hashem gave us the mitzvot for an important reason. It's not just for us to be rewarded and have a ticket to the world to come. It is not possible, and Hashem knows this, Obviously, it is not possible for the human being to do battle with the yetzerara, with the evil inclination, with all the temptations that exist, unless he adapts a certain way of life. A way of life that involves actions, deeds, ma'asim, actions that continuously remind him on a regular basis who he is. He goes out the door, he sees the mezuzah. He puts on the tefillin. You know what's inside the parchment, what's written in the tefillin? The blessings that he makes, the words that he says, the Shema said that he says. It's not just that he believes it in his heart. He's actually saying it, practicing it, teaching it, learning about it, reviewing it. That's the only way a Jew can survive, is if he actually fulfills mitzvot. That is the basic idea of, behind the observance of mitzvot, behind the idea of... of doing acts, not just belief. 
But Christianity, of course, said that belief was only what was necessary. Comes along this group of people and basically adapted the same thing. Obviously, they were trying to get away from the ghetto. They were trying to have equal rights. They couldn't take the pressure of being second-class citizens. All of that is good, and I understand that. But that does not justify moving away from it completely. How, do you, how does a Jew have the gall to, this, to basically say, this is not our life. We don't believe in it. Torah is not in It was made up. You have the right to all of a sudden change that which was accepted for so long? Part of it has to do with them, a great number of Jews belonging to a group called the Erev Rav. And the Erev Rav, as the Kabbalah elaborates a little bit more, are certain individuals amongst us, amongst the Jewish people, who do not really have a divine spark in them. They're therefore not attracted to that which is divine. They couldn't care less about that which is divine. They don't want it. They joined the Jewish people when we left Egypt. They wanted to become like us because we were leaving, not because they wanted Judaism, not because they wanted the Torah, not because they believed in Hashem. And we allowed them. They joined us. And ever since, there are some individuals amongst us that don't like Judaism. Not that they're secular. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And that's where the problem begins. And now we got to the, your question. Why don't we go out and attempt to bring them closer to Judaism? Okay, they've strayed. The rabbis who were around back then, including the Khatam Sofer, Rabbi Kiva Eger, and later on, uh, I think the Malbim too, a lot of people who had a lot of trouble with them, they had many, many battles with them, came to their realization that these people are dangerous. They're dangerous. They're not just not religious and not observant, not interested. They're actually dangerous. And therefore, it's better to allow them, as I said before, to disappear than to allow them, chas shalom, any access to our Torah. If there's any danger from our, for our Torah being altered in any way, that they may have the ability to convince other Jews to drop their, their beliefs, their traditions, if there's any such a chance, we should not allow it. It would be better for them to disappear. And that is what, of course, the rabbis back then believed because of the situation that they were living through. Back then, these people posed a big danger. The question, however, is today. Today, we're not talking about the leaders back then, the founders. Today we're talking about followers. Right, I'm getting to that. I'm, ge I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. The Gemara, in speaking about idol worshippers, tells us that today we don't have true idol worshippers. True idol worshippers of, of back then, they knew what they were doing, or they thought they knew what they were doing. They did it because of certain beliefs that they had. Today, anybody who follows what was practiced back then, he's simply following, following a tradition. He doesn't necessarily believe in the exact same nonsense of back then. So what you have today are many, many Jews who still have a Jewish spark in them. They still have a Jewish spark in them. It's a little bit extinguished, but not completely extinguished. And for us, it is a mitzvah to go after them and bring them back and closer to Yahadut. Because they're only following. They don't know any better. It is the leader's fault, the leaders who are in charge of these congregations, who are selling them lakshan, as we say in Yiddish, babamises, stories, that have nothing to do with Judaism. And as a result of that, many, many Jews are being deprived, are continuing to grow up ignorant, and eventually intermarrying with non-Jews. You do have some who have become Balet Shuvah who have come back to Judaism, but not enough. And the reason why is because you still have people out there who are allowing this to happen. They are the leaders. 
So the, bigger, the biggest problem we have is with the leaders, much more than with the members. We have nothing against the members. On the contrary, we feel for every Jew and we care about every Jew. And I hope, I really hope, that somehow if any contact is made, if any interest is shown on their part, then there could be a little bit of rapprochement, a little bit of getting closer. But it is very risky. The halachais, as I mentioned earlier, were not allowed to even enter the Beit Knesset, the temple of the reform, because we, it should not appear that we are identifying or supporting what they do. I guess the, the only thing that I would like to add at this point is really more of a message to all of those who are out there who do not know too much about their Judaism is that they should really give themselves a chance to rediscover what Judaism is. Give themselves a chance and not rely on their predecessors, on those people who have led them astray. Give yourself a chance. One who really wants to discover Judaism, there are many seminars today and there are many uh, informative websites where one can gain access to tremendous amount of Jewish knowledge. Hundreds of thousands of cassettes, right, Zalman, are available. Hundreds of thousands of cassettes. Hundreds of thousands, not thousands. On just about any Jewish topic that you ever thought of. So today, it's very easy. You don't even have to leave your home. I mean, obviously all of you came here because you want to hear it in person. But all of these lectures are also going to be on the Internet. There's a lot of information, a vast amount of information. This is the information age, which is a very, very good thing because today, Baruch Hashem, we have the tools to disseminate and to reach Jews all over the world in a way that was not possible before. There's been a tremendous amount of ignorance. There's been a tremendous amount of, of uh, oppression and, and, and challenges that the Jewish people have had to go through throughout their history. And as a result of that, many of them are ignorant. Many of them have intermarried and have assimilated. But today, Baruch Hashem, it is possible to come back as long as there is a little bit of an interest. As the psychologists say, you can only bring a horse to water, you can't force him to drink. Many of these uh, Jews, especially the leaders, will not want to hear what you have to say. And these include not only Jews who have become reformed, but this also includes Messianic Jews who believe you know in what. It believes Jews who, are un who unfortunately have been caught up in another trap of another cult that I would rather not mention the name. I'll give you a clue. It has to do with witnesses, false witnesses. But you know what I mean by that. There are many, many Jews that have fallen into cults. There are many cults out there. Many of them who are meditating in the Himalayas as we're speaking right now trying to discover the truth when the truth is really in their backyards, in their own backyard. But they're still searching in India and all these faraway places for the truth. The movement, the reform movement, has Baruch Hashem not been very successful in Israel because Israelis are not used to this kind of thing. This is a European invention that eventually was imported into America. So Baruch Hashem, it has not made strides over there. There you either are secular, traditional, or orthodox. But reform? What's reform? Unfortunately, in America, this has become a problem where people have adopted this as, as being Jewish. But it's very, very much not Jewish. What I would like to say to anyone out there who's listening to this message is as follows. The way to come back to Judaism is to first attempt to understand some big questions. The question about how the world was created, what the, pers the purpose of creation is. In other words, there are many, many lectures out there that if one studies them or participates in them, lectures that cover topics about the purpose of life, I believe that that is a very good way to begin, to do battle with all the beliefs that one may have had till now. Jews that grew up in Russia 
have a little bit of a difficulty because they have been brainwashed with communism for so many years. And the older you are, and those beliefs have been there for so long, it's very really, it's really hard to remove all those beliefs and ideas and start from scratch. And the older a person is, it's harder for him to do teshuvah, to change his ways, to begin a whole brand new life that it is, can be quite demanding. Judaism is quite demanding. It requires a certain amount of discipline. But nevertheless, it's possible. What I would like to suggest, therefore, is as follows. The message is very, very simple. A Jew needs to make a decision. Does he want to become a part of the Jewish people and their beliefs or not? If yes, then he should hook up and become a part of the link of this continuous chain that has become one of the greatest success stories of all of mankind. And that is the survival of the Jewish people despite all the oppression, despite the diaspora, despite all the challenges. And the reason is, Am Yisrael Chai. Am Yisrael Baruch Hashem lives on forever. Thank you.